Thank you, Dr. Paradise. Uh, another question. Yeah, maybe you could. Your um, name and where you're from. Sorry, Henry Burr from Seattle. Um, kind of help us, the us, and, um, think about how to maneuver through a, 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 new, a new minefield which has to do with cyber issues. Mm. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'm sure you have the answer. <laughs> so, you know, I had a patient who was sexually abused, but it was videoed in such a way that it looked like it was voluntary, and it was so horrific that she suppressed the whole thing until the person doing the video and sent it out to <coughs> her classmates on her cell phones. Mm -hmm. And the school said 21 days of sick time after that, you're out of the school, for example. Police said, we can't prove there was a crime here because the video just shows something that could be consensual. That's one kind of example. Another kind of example is, we were talking about yesterday, a workshop bullying and mm. what information is on Facebook and what's done with it and what's legal and what's illegal and you put, you send out stuff to your best friends and they forward it to other people and then your parents want to monitor that and do they have a legal right to do that and do they have the ethical right to do that and so it's all kind of mushed together maybe you want to push it a little bit. That's a good legal term, mushed. Mushed, <laughs> yeah. I'm going to adopt that for one of my next articles, mushed. Um, my temptation is to say I really don't have the answer to your question because I really don't. Um, I am concerned about those issues and what I say now I'm really not saying as a lawyer because I have no expertise in the technical legal aspects of you know cyber law and so on. Uh, so I'm, what I'm saying is really as kind of a friend and a human being um, I think these are very, very troubling issues, which I think need to be addressed at least as much from an ethical perspective as mm -hmm. from a legal perspective. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, Bob Lum's question a minute ago about, you know, did due process turn into a good thing gone bad could easily replicate itself in looking for solutions to these very challenging issues of privacy and sexting and cyberbullying and so on and so forth in the law. Not that there shouldn't be some laws and not that we shouldn't do as good a job as we possibly can to craft those laws carefully and implement them well, but that if we don't put even more effort into um, addressing these issues with our young people, with ourselves, with the social institutions from an ethical and um, social, you know, ethical, moral, and social responsibility perspective, I think we're doing ourselves a grave disservice and we'll be very sorry where we end up, you know, five years from now or two years from now. Ed, you're next. Um, I went to the Institute. And who are you, Ed? I am Ed Gottlieb from Atlanta. <laughs> and um, thank you. <laughs> I, I went to the Institute yesterday because I didn't know anything about sex trafficking. It seemed very far away. Um, and I thought that since I've got 600,000 kids in Atlanta that we take care of, uh, we ought to know something about that. So the first video she shows is about sex trafficking in Atlanta. <laughs> uh, so my, my question is, um, do you see a process that, it seems like it's an important issue that we don't know much about, or at least I don't know, know much about. Is there some way that the SAM could get better involved with this? Is there some process that we ought to move this further along? So the question is, how could Sam become more involved in this process that so many of us really don't know enough about? And I would say that there are probably many ways in which we could. Um, you know, one very sort of historically well-established and, and fairly obvious way would be for Sam to have a position paper on one or more, you know, position papers or statements on the issue. Hopefully not just um, as a SAM position paper, but one that SAM might take the lead on and then try to engage other organizations in either adopting for themselves or, or joining in as a, joint, as a joint statement. So that's one thing. 
Um, one of the presenters, Carol Smolensky, yesterday was, talked about a code of conduct um, for the travel industry that has been widely adopted around the world and only adopted in a more limited way in, in the United States. And uh, someone, either she or someone in the audience mentioned, you know, perhaps Sam could make a decision that we're only going to hold our meetings at sites where the hotels have entered into this code of conduct Ooh. with respect to sex trafficking. Um, and so I, I, there could be um, other presentations at our annual meetings. There could be Sam um, sort of active outreach to organizations that work on this issue to try to develop some, you know, sort of liaison relationships so that we could be participants in educating our own membership, educating the general public, educating our families and our patients. Um, so those are just a few thoughts. Could I just interject and also say, in thinking about these issues, we need to be well aware that uh, um, commercial sex is not just an issue for females. I am yes. so yes. glad you said that, Bob. I was going to mention that, and I think that it is very easy to uh, fall into thinking about this as something that affects girls. Uh, it does not only affect girls, it affects boys. It affects young girls, it affects young women, it affects young boys, it affects young men. And uh, those are all within the purview of SAM and our commitment to young people. Um, the, the, the data is not as nearly as good as it needs to be in this arena. Um, SAM members could conduct research in this area. Uh, the Institute of Medicine has just initiated a committee, which I'm a member of, um, to look at and, and write recommendations on commercial sexual exploitation of minors in the United States. Uh, there will be a set of recommendations about research, hopefully that, you know, despite the budgetary you know, drama that we see every day. Uh, hopefully that will drive some funding for research and SAM members could, could be very useful in doing some of that research. The current data suggests that the average age in the United States is of entry into prostitution is 13 for girls and 12 for boys. <coughs> um, okay, we, so we have three hands up. Know. You have yeah, Gary Sigman from uh, Chicago, Iowa. Abigail, I'm interested, you would be the best, uh, your career is very well um, experientially able to answer this or to discuss this issue, which is an area of frustration for me as a medical profession for many years, which is the relationship between the two professions. I see more collaboration for advocacy at organizational levels, but very little for cases. If you look at, for instance, Cook County, one of the largest population jurisdictions, you see absolutely appalling um, representation for advocacy for children's matters. You see judges who make decisions without much knowledge or training in youth, mental health, etc. Mm -hmm. And you see child reps who basically just volunteer for it just to, to make more when they're appointed by the judges as a, without any expertise. Um, in addition, you know, if you take medical training, the only attorney representation that most people see in their training is hospital counsel, which as you well taught me is not advocates for, for you. Um, so, so there is quite a ways we can go, it seems, in terms of building a relationship. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you asked that, Gary. How, how can we build better relationships between healthcare professionals and lawyers? And I think that that needs to go on at several <coughs> levels. Um, it needs to go on at the level of national organizations. Um, you know, I haven't really uh, put nearly as much effort as I might or could have into trying to, you know, bring Sam together with people in the ABA or with the ABA as an organization. Um, so there, there's that kind of work. But I think even more important than that 
there needs to be work done um, at the state level and the local level and the individual level. I think that, you know, for someone who helped me found the Center for Adolescent Health and the Law, now went left to go to law school, which she had always said she would do, and she now is the lawyer for something called the Medical Legal Partnership yes. um, in North Carolina. And there are, this was started by Barry Zuckerman, Barry Zuckerman in, in Boston. Boston. Um, but he, you know, started it and now it has proliferated and there are medical legal partnerships in cities around the country or states around the country. And it's a model whereby lawyers uh, may even be physically located in hospitals mm -hmm. but certainly are in very close uh, collaborative relationships with, with hospitals and healthcare sites so that they can provide legal advice and representation to the patients and their families, the children and adolescents and their families. And I think that's one model, you know, happening at a very individual level, very good way to increase the understanding between the professions, but also to increase the sort of beneficial uh, work of lawyers on behalf of medical patients and and uh, I certainly benefited in the few I haven't done a lot of litigation in my career but in those few instances where I did work on some big cases I benefited enormously even from some people in this room you know lending their expertise to those cases and strengthening those arguments in a way that they would never have been able to uh, go forward without that, without that participation. We have that a lot. We use it in our department of peds. We, we help support a medical legal partnership that's been very, very helpful. There are two, uh, three more questions. Michelle, you can go next.